Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome EFI CEO, Jeff Jacobson. You can do better than that, not for me, but just make some more noise, would you? <laughs> ah, there you go, there you go. Great to see everybody, it's been a whole two hours. I hope you did a lot of learning in those two hours. I think you'll all agree with me, these fireside chats are really some of the best things that we do during Connect, because we really get to find out things about people we otherwise didn't know. I had the honor of being the receiver of questions a few years ago, and it's nice to be on the other end now, especially considering who our guest is today. So this gentleman, without question, did have an association with EFI for almost 25 years, joining in 1995. But I really have some specific questions for him. Let me, let me say this, there's no question that he led this great company as the CEO for 18 years, from 2000 to 2018. A little known tidbit is he actually worked for Apple early in his career. I did not know that. Perhaps he was the creator of the iPod, for all I know. However, here's where I want to probe. Allegedly, and I say allegedly, he's Israeli. I don't know. It seems very convenient to me. You know, when you're running a startup, to say you're Israeli is a benefit. I believe we'd all agree that Israeli companies do pretty well with technology companies. Now, let me say this. He has a pretty good accent. I've heard him speak somewhat intelligently about artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality. But if you remember during my keynote, when I spoke about Andre Gide, the famous French author, who had the quote about if you want to discover new oceans, you have to have the courage to lose sight of the shore. As I was doing that research on the French author, here is what I found. So, is he guy or is he gee? Let's bring him out and let's find out. Big welcome for Guy Geck. Thank you very much. All right. Now, just, you might not be aware, but you sit in this seat this time. Ha. Huh. <laughs> you know, it was really hard. They said, please welcome EFI CEO. And I started to walk, and then <laughs> you went out. Well, oh. you, you know, they did say that this is the first time they've had two EFI CEOs on the same stage. But I think the requirement was you had to have the same first and last initial at the same time. <laughs> I think. Uh, GG, JJ. Yes. Yeah. So I think I, I probably speak on behalf of some of the audience that saw me here. And sometimes even having one CEO of EFI was too much, so two is <laughs> really scary. So look, it, it is great having you here, and I know everybody loves seeing you. And, and I feel like this is a real coup. It's like interviewing Barbara Walters, you know. You, you did this for 18 years, and now you get to be asked the questions. I'm a lot younger, by the way. <laughs> okay. So how does it feel to be on this side? Uh, you know, the <laughs> it's uh, when you're on the other side, or you give the, the talk that you gave, you have a really full control of what's going on. When you're on this side, you actually don't. You ask the questions, you ask the follow-up. You, you I have a feeling you control everything anyway. Well, I don't <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a little scary. I, I, wanna, I think what I want to do is kind of an EFI tradition. I want to start, you know, normally in our culture, we set internally expectations very high. And I know you, you will set very high, you're already setting very high expectations. I talked to some of the guys here. <laughs> but externally, with investors and customers, we like to set expectation low. So even if things are not going as great, they feel like they got what they want and maybe more. So I feel in, in this tradition, I want to set expectation very low right now. <laughs> <laughs> Having all the many, so Under many promise and overperform. Yeah, as I, here is how I'm going to do it. Um, when I stepped down you know, 14 months ago, uh, my family got me into a program that it was a workshop in New York for stand-up comedy. <laughs> uh, they thought it's time for me to be a little more funny. And so, uh, I don't know why. And so, and at the end, by the way, as a graduation, you go to one of the big comedy clubs in New York and you actually perform with the other comedians. And I can tell you that the people that knew about it wanted to buy the entire uh, nightclub, so because they knew I was going to look very silly. Uh, so here's the thing, I did not do it yet, so don't expect me to be funny. <laughs> so look, I'm sure inquiring minds want to know, what have you been up to? What are you doing with your day? 
Nothing. <laughs> no. I actually, um, surprisingly, I was a little more busy than I thought. You know, and it was always a mystery what I'm going to do. And part of it is when, you know, you do the job, you're running at like 200 miles a minute, and there's so many things. You're driving to work, telling yourself you're going to work on five things, and then you end up working on 10 different things because the day exactly. controlled you. Uh, and so, you know, I've been a CEO, I think it was 90 years, 76 quarters I like to do. It's a public company, not that private is, is any easier. Uh, and company had to go through a lot of transformations. We faced tough times, death potentially, uh, or the death of the company, um, in a couple of times at least. And you feel as a CEO, the shoulders on, the, the, the weight on your shoulder. Definitely you have like, we ended up with 3,500 people. There's 3,500 families that depend on you. That's right. You have customers that <coughs> spend a lot of money normally on your products. Sometimes they take, many times they take a loan to buy your products and they bet on your product to help them to go the digital transformation. And then the third thing is shareholders expecting you to continue to deliver quarter after quarter. There's Correct. like, you know, you're watching play off in football, the 49ers get, you know, a day to celebrate. <laughs> no, in public company, you get a 10 seconds and then you go to the next quarter. Exactly. So I heard you went to the playoff game Sunday. Say again? I heard you went to the 49ers went, game yes, Sunday. I did go to the 49ers game. I still, my hearing still recovered. It was very noisy. It was an amazing game. So I'm not, so let, since you are, I'm giving a very long answer to a very short <laughs> and simple. Uh, so what, what it is. So what, after having all this uh, responsibility and so on, what I really wanted to do is slow things down to zero. I mean, you, have, you can take it kind of two ways. Slow things slowly every week and every month. Or you take things to zero and then you start to build up. And I think the best thing is to take things to zero. Uh, and then you start to think what you want to do because when you're CEO, you don't have time to think what you want to do next. And so uh, first month was all about slowing things to zero. Uh, first of all, rule number one, no alarms. I sleep as long as I sleep. And you know as a CEO, you don't, I mean on the road, you barely sleep. I mean, but can you sleep? Can you really sleep? It, actually, I was surprised myself. I slept well. So first month I slept well and then I, I wasn't tired. There was really not a lot going on to get tired from, so I didn't sleep as well. But first month I slept well. They also had a rule of not having more than one meeting a day. So I will have somebody who say, you know, and a lot of people I need to catch up with, I wanted to catch up, they want to catch up. So finally I have my calendar for myself. And uh, so, uh, you know, so I would schedule a meeting with them and somebody says, hey, are you free on Tuesday? And I said, no, I have a breakfast meeting. And they said, well, we can meet for lunch. I said, no, I'm doing one meeting a day. So that, I tried to keep this uh, uh, rule uh, which, which works. So I really took it down to zero. And then I started to add, uh, took a couple of classes in Stanford, started to read books, uh, started to read, uh, you know, more, you know, get interested in, in topics. Uh, but kind of the, the reality again um, uh, kind of came and rescued me. So I got, first of all, on the professional side, I got uh, asked to join a board of a great company, Consumer Electronic Logitech. Most people know them. Really great company, and so for me it was a new area, things to learn, new area. My keyboard broke, by the way. I didn't call keyboard, you. Keyboard, uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of things that are today controlled, to, you know, connected to the cloud. So the mouse connected yeah. to the cloud, and the video camera, and it's, there's a lot of great innovations they do. Three billion dollar company uh, that I needed to learn, and you know, work the CEO and, and get into this. I'm still on the board of Checkpoint, which is an amazing cybersecurity company, and so that an area I could learn more. I got some ask by. Uh, people that invest in, in, in startups, promising startups, that I will mentor the CEO, and I did that, and that was immensely uh, rewarding, because when you like mentor somebody else, uh, really, it's, it's their problem. You just tell them what to do. And if they do it, they do it, they don't do it. It's like, I don't know, maybe I don't have grandkids, but maybe it's like having a great kid. You tell your kids what to do, and it's their problem. I mean, either they follow or not, but you know. Anyway, so uh, I did that. But what's really happened is that, you know, we, we are, some of you, you know, obviously, uh, my wife and I, bought this uh, uh, very special piece of land in the Silicon Valley. And the goal was to build a downsizing home. And, um, and this feels like it started last Drupa, by the way. It's, it's what? It feels like it started last Drupa, your home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it feels like it started last Drupa, right. And, uh, and so uh, we, I got myself more and more involved. And actually, the more I got involved, the house got more complex, the schedule got longer, it was more expensive, and so on. So definitely, I added value to the process. But, um, we added, uh, we added general contractors and started to be some friction, uh, mostly not in his fault, but started to have some friction. And at some point, very early on, my wife and I said, just 
why don't we be the general contractors? We didn't, never did that before, but I've never been a CEO before. So now, kind of, I'm working as a general contractor for, for myself with my wife. We are the customers, we are the employees, we are management, we are the shareholders. So it's fantastic. We screw up, we're laughing. Enough, nobody to blame but us. So th that's kind of where I'm spending most of my time. And, and I heard you kept it in the industry because you bought the land from somebody in the industry. Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. So actually, bef the, being a technologist, we, you know, we develop it with, and actually I bought, I didn't know, normally I bring some videos and something funny, so I bought some, and Brian, first of all, do you have, here's my first word. So this is our office, it's a trailer. This is how it looks like when I show up to work at 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, sitting in the office, uh, and then, we use a lot of virtual reality. I get to your question, I'm not avoiding it. Uh, we use a lot of VR, so here's me. Uh, and you know, this is the way of the future, virtual are you reality. Going, are you going swimming or no? <laughs> you go, I go, so we go into the pool, by the way. It's amazing, it's so real, and you can realize how the house is gonna be and make some changes. So one of the things is, um, it happened to me multiple times where I would walk into the house with the VR, I'll get to the kitchen, and I'll get tired, and I will try to lean on the countertop. Other than there's no countertop, but it's so real. So, uh, so, yeah. so what is the story about this place? Uh, we were very fortunate to buy from the Hewlett, uh, Hewlett family, that's the H and the HP, the founder and somebody that was really important in the culture of Silicon Valley, the, their, their daughter Lynn. And the way it shaped up over the years is there's like a nice uh, park and they live on the park and so it's a great access to trails and so on. And on the other side, if you, you know, it's very close, it's HP headquarters, still HP yeah. headquarters. So, uh, you know, so we uh, bought the land and we, uh, we're building there and it's kind of staying in the industry because it's HP. Exactly. And so, just one more thing if I may on Please. This. So, when we bought, yeah, don't, don't run the movie yet. Brian, oh, you have pets. Brian, Brian, you're ahead of the <laughs> schedule here. When we bought, Arthur is running the movie. So this is the pets we have. I'll tell you five people, don't, don't, don't follow my I see you got a cat. Yes, I have a cat. <laughs> Um, yeah, we did not expect that. We talked to the neighbors about mountain lions, and they said, oh, no, they're in the mountains. This is too close to civilization. So we put some cameras, and sure enough, first time we got a mountain lion, and another two weeks, and every time we're getting a mountain lion. And uh, so I tell people, when we meet at my property, we hike, and then I send them the video, nobody showed up. And so, some of the guys at the EFI actually were willing, and then there was, you know, there was a family we followed, and one night we saw mother and three adults' kids following. That's, here it is. Uh, and since I got this video, nobody wants to meet me. Again. You didn't know you'd be here for an episode of National Geographic, did you? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, four of them, pretty big. We're excited, but we didn't meet them yet in person. But uh, So, you were talking about meetings before. I'm really curious about this, because I used to tease Irene that, of course, we never get to make decisions at home, so I'd kiss her goodbye in the morning and say, I'm going to get to work so I can make some decisions for myself. <laughs> what was the transition like after being a CEO for 18 years? You mentioned you have meetings. I mean, in the past, Toby, Gabby, and team had to do what you said, but yeah. now people don't have to do that. So what do you do? What's it like? Um, I think, first of all, it's really a big transition. <laughs> so at, at home, I was never anywhere near the CEO, and my family never fought much of my whatever achievement in career and so on. I was kind of the lowest ranked member, but, uh, and a person that they enjoy making fun of. But uh, still, you know, going in, not having an assistant. I mean, I had the executive assistant, pretty phenomenal, Gina, you know, yeah. you worked with her uh, for, for all those years. And everything was, if you're late, she tell you you're late, you know, you, you know, everything is, you can't make a mistake. And then you go and um, start to schedule meetings. And like, I showed up in a meeting and the meeting is not there because it's the following week. Actually, one of the most embarrassing things, I scheduled a lunch meeting with one of the most busiest executives in Silicon Valley. I didn't show up. Getting an email, he just came back, what happened? It's like, oh my God, that's not good. Uh, so he probably thought it was Gigek, not Gigek. Yeah, 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 it was, yeah, I told him it was Gigek. <laughs> it's like, you know, he went to the spam. Uh, so it, yeah, it's definitely an adjustment, not having all the help that you have and you know, doing all the things yourself. And, but it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's fun. So, so let me ask you, we've been friends for a long time. You have 800 of your closest friends here who have come to see you for all those years. Just between us, what are you going to do next? It's a really tough question. Uh, I never thought that I would do sabbatical retirement thing is going to last a year. I think between some of the people here, the bet was like three months. Because you know, I like the action, I like the energy, I like to do, I like to be busy. 
Uh, but I kind of build a busy agenda. I'm working as a general contractor with my wife, and so I kind of have a work. And I enjoy that. And I got a you know, couple of opportunities. People call me to go run pretty uh, amazing companies. And I said no, but it wasn't like a tough decision. Nothing really? inside of me felt like I want to do it. So kind of thinking, you know, we're going to finish the house in 18 months and we're going to move in, you know, it's, and in the next, it, it, so what are we going to do after that? I still have plenty of energy and I still can do things. I kind of look at that. I probably have kind of three options uh, that I'm going to pick. One is uh, just do more of those things, just be more mentor, uh, taking more board roles, being maybe chairman of a couple of startups, helping other young CEOs to get to a billion dollar, uh, and not having an, any like a responsibility of being a leader of a company, just helping other leaders, which I find I enjoy a lot, so that's definitely one possibility. The other possibility is maybe I'll, I'll run a company. I mean, that, that being a leader and working with a team, and you know, it's, there's, there's no more fun than that. I think the chance if I do that is probably gonna be more of a startup, growing it back to a billion, mm -hmm. something like that, versus taking a much bigger company and, and take it from there. Uh, because I feel like I'm, I get much more excited about that. And then the third option is I still like to do more good for the world, and I've been very fortunate in my life. And I look at people that are way smarter than me, and a lot more means like Bill Gates wanted to cure malaria from the world, and uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, but they, they, they have really big goals. And, uh, so maybe I'll go help one of them to do something, maybe I'll do with my little means some of them, just making the world better. So those things, three things are possibilities. But I know you, you're a very competitive person. What do you do to replace that, your competitive juices? How do you funnel that? Um, first of all, you make it like your own competition. So it's like I used to say, you know, how long does it take me when I land an international flight to get out of custom? And I, you know, so six minutes. From the moment I leave the airport, six minutes was the record. And you know, so you have eight minutes and then seven. So I do that. I start to play basketball. Really? And, and if you think about like a guy with no skills, trying to play basket, that's me. Uh, and I'm playing with people a lot younger than me. And, and most of the time, a lot taller than me. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's funny for me, not, maybe not for them, but I do that. We have, we have this uh, great uh, player, female. She, she's a professional female player, and she's playing with us, she's, um, she's amazing. And she, oftentimes, she's kind of coaching us as she, she's playing. And with me, every time somebody will uh, s get screened and I will guard somebody I'm not supposed to guard, she say, you got the mismatch, you got the mismatch. <laughs> And so one time she said, hey, uh, what's your name? I said, the mismatch. I'm the, the mismatch. mismatch. And she was very embarrassed. I said, no, it's fine. Keep calling the mismatch. So I have that. I play bridge. I, you know, I know you're early on. So I'm trying to get back. And you know, my mental capacity is not nearly as good, good as work bad. But you know, there's one of the three, four things I'm good at. So I'm trying to Excellent. work on it. Look, you've obviously, you mentioned the billion dollars. You've been, you were instrumental in leading that charge for a billion dollars. It was a great vision. What gave you the vision and how difficult was it to achieve? First of all, you know, now when you look and reflect, it all looked nice and easy and so on. It's, the truth is it took a while for us, for me, to figure out what we want to do. Uh, I, got, I took over in 2000. Fiery uh, was a great business, but most of our business, almost the entire, was controller for the office. And we got started to be replaced by Xerox, by Canon, but not for bad reasons. They just had an integrated controller as part of the copy. Right. And so it was a free replacement. We had to figure out what to do. In the beginning, I didn't know. I mean, we, we, the, fir the first thing we did is trying to figure out how do we earn more time. So we had good cash balance, but that would go away if we didn't. So we raised prizes, we bought competitors like Splash, like MGI, people remember that, just to make sure we have enough time left to figure it out. But still, it was tough to figure it out. And then, you know, we knew that whatever we're gonna do, we need to stay close to something we're good at. We can't just say, we wanna be just great and something completely unrelated. Uh, and so, because there's somebody going to be closer to this and you're not there right. with them. So we said we really love images, in, we really like printing, we really like software, we're very good at embedded systems. And so let's look at things that, uh, you know, so uh, we needed some help, we hired two guys. One that was a senior guy from McKinsey, one a senior guy from Bain, Roy Douglas, I think still with EFI, maybe Zero. And we had four ideas that we kind of got to the playoff level, and we, we talked to our board about it. And we gave two to each one of them, Mark and Roy, and they led that, and everybody in the management team worked on that. And the four ideas was one was getting a lot deeper into embedded system. We did a really nice embedded firing. Right. And we said, we know how to do embedded system. They can do it high speed, relatively low cost, and so on. 
is there other industries we can, we can bring the embedded system? And actually, one of the companies that we were considering to buy to then accelerate that, if it is, I just looked a few months ago, and they're well over a billion dollar revenue, very successful, so it was a good bet right. if we took it, right? The second bet was getting in consumer electronics. So we have images, color management. What if we're trying to do a controller for high definition TV? You know, that we're talking about 2000, 2001. Sure. I mean, it wasn't as good as today. And, that, and you know, we, Blackberry started to come, and we knew at some point it's going to be colorful, you know, fun. And so what if we try to translate that? We know how to do hardware. We know how to do software. The third thing was uh, more like getting really doubling down on all sort of workflow around data conversion to the web and to uh, printing, but a lot more around the web. And the four was to get into industrial in, uh, printing. And it's one, not because we felt that that's the biggest market, it probably was the smallest out of all of them, or maybe, you know, definitely not the highest, the biggest. It, it won because it was really exciting for us. We said, you know, we love printing. The printing industry, we need to get into application that is not just document printing. Right. Uh, we can be a leading force. We need to do some acquisitions. For example, we were a bunch of software engineers, people to do the little ASIC. We never had the printing system. We never had ink. Uh, and so we had to figure out how we're going to go about it. And we ended up in 2005, we announced the acquisition of UTEC. And it was shocking to people because we were not in this in the category of exactly. equipment. And it was shocking to us too when we <laughs> decided. I was really a tough. You were surprised, huh? Yeah, I was very surprised. <laughs> yeah, I was, we worked with this for, for a while. And I remember actually meeting with you a few weeks after we announced that, uh, you and some other executives from Kodak. So you were very gracious. You thought that it was a brave move. Great. You have to do something. You congratulate us. I said, if I can help you. And so on, and you know, you know, like 15 years later, you're actually going to yeah, exactly. <laughs> deliver on that. Exactly. <laughs> but it was one of the uh, Kodak executives that was the entire day and night keep telling me, are you mental? <laughs> now, as an immigrant, I didn't even know what mental mean, but I it's probably not a good thing. He says, where are you buying equipment? You have no idea how printers work. You know, it's like a bunch of software engineers. You do OEM. You never sold directly anything in your life. So... Okay. How did you, the, the one thing I, always, I did wonder about then is how did you get over the hump of saying, all right, in some ways I might be competing with some of my customers, and that's always a very difficult thing. All right. The, the beauty of buying Viewtech was that not enough really of our customers was in a big way in wide format. It was still a niche. Mm -hmm. Digital was much more advanced there. I mean, we got this question. People say, what will stop you to get into packaging? What can stop you to getting into document printing? From the beginning, it says we will not get into document printing. There's so many great players already, and this business we expect to shrink over time. We're not going to get into this. You get our word, and I think people believe us. So I think for them, yeah, it wasn't an easy one, and it was part of the bet. But I think they believe us. They thought maybe it's good. We can team up with PFI. Some of them sold the product over yeah. time. Uh, a lot of explanations to do, but I think that we had sincerely thought it will help the pump. So you've been out now for, let's call it about a year in rough terms. When you look back, what are the one or two things that you're really most proud of? Um, that's a Don't be modest. <laughs> um, no, there's so many. I mean, the team did so many. All right, many. be more modest. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I mean, we have three hours after all, right? So it's, we, can, we can list at least 10 of them. I would say, like, if I look at the first decade, you know, some after 2000, just the recovery from the fiery situation, and then getting and reviving the fiery, actually, bringing it to the yeah. higher end and so on. So getting to a point we had a million fiery, we opened the NASDAQ. I think you probably were there. That was a great, I think, achievement. I would say then if I look at this, uh, the last uh, decade, uh, it was really an amazing decade. We helped so many customers. One of the things that was really amazing for us was to bring Nozomi to market. I mean, you remember the Drupa was Thunderwood. Yeah. We had this high-speed internet that could bring. And it didn't print at the time because we decided not to jeopardize the development of the engineers and not getting them to which I think was a, the right decision. We had just a mock-up. Uh, and our competitor says, Dozomi in Japanese mean hope. Those guys hope it will work, it will never work. But you, you, you came, I gave you the two. And then like uh, a year later, the first installation in this company in the Hosa in Spain, I came to visit it working. And uh, I mean, that must be one of the highest, if not the highest moment. So I go to visit, I, I don't know what to expect. I mean, it's the system is still not working well. It's the first one, it's one of the kind. The guy that ran production is waiting to me outside. He's not even in his office. I said, oh my God, it's gonna be a long day. And he says, I just wanna thank you for your wonderful technology. 
how many times you have the first of any product and that's what you have in the customer. That was wonderful. And then I met the three heads of uh, the development teams, the software, mechanical, and electrical. Okay. Two out of three female engineers. They spent the entire night, they had to do an upgrade, not because of me, because the customer needed. But they wanted to print when I arrived, so they worked the entire night to bring to print. So after a full night, I'm very tired, very proud, and the machine works extremely well. So that was definitely. So I mean, again, if I look at that, it was kind of the highlight kind of point, but we, you know, we started a decade, we were on defense, $400 million of revenue, lost money for the first time in 09, a lot of people left, did not right. believe we can recover. We've, you know, eight years, we got to a billion dollar, uh, we delivered on, on the vision, and, and you know, now, obviously, no pressure, I think the new CEO is gonna take <laughs> the new heights. <laughs> So we talked about the thing you're most proud of. I think in all of our careers, certainly mine, you wish, I wish I had a couple of do-overs, things I could do differently. What would be your do-over? So um, if we really want to talk about things I'm regretting, I, I think I would need another couple of hours. <laughs> I, I mean, you make a lot of mistakes. You move a lot very fast. The company make a lot of mistakes. As a CEO, you make more mistakes than anybody else. And everybody knows when you make a mistake. Don't even try to hide it. But you're swinging the bet. You're taking chances, you're which taking is good. Chances. I think I learned just to admit that I make a mistake, make everybody admit right. that they make a mistake, and that's a very helpful. Correct. And so uh, you make mistakes. If you make mistakes, uh, I would say your mistake is CEO much more consequential to the company, to the employees, to the shareholders, to the customers. So obviously it's hell to see your own mistakes. Um, but I would say the things that really bother, kind of I didn't lose sleep at night, not business mistake, because you did, I knew we are going to make some progress, some step back. It was anything to do with where we hurt customers, when we really supported too early. We forgot to do QA. We promised customers it will do A, and you know, we've, we've all with good intentions, yeah. and then it didn't really do. It's painful. They, it's painful. The customers say, hey, you know, I lost a job for my best customer because of you. You go home, and it's like, it's like if you feel so yeah. bad with yeah. yourself. And if I can come back and just make that a little better, I um, agree. I would de definitely. I, would I don't do think it. people realize that how gut wrenching it is when you let a customer when, down. Yeah, right. right. I agree with you. And thankfully, I mean, we did a lot of good for customers. I mean, we we would not have gotten to the sales we got if it wasn't for customers sticking with us. And, but the, those areas were the time when we did it was just it was just a gut wrench. Okay. So as you look at the segments we play in today, what do you see as the best opportunities for us? I think there's still tremendous opportunity with the the tr digital transformation of anything. And there's a lot of things that have images on them, uh, and even in areas where there's clearly some, some decline, and I'll start with that, maybe I'll talk about areas that are going. Um, for example, document printing. A lot of people here are still growing, making good business yeah. because they either consolidate or getting more efficient or getting some unique or they, they tell, they sell in a better way the capabilities to their customers. I can tell you just from my personal experience, I go for the last few years to the computer the Consumer Electronics Show, that's the biggest show in Las Vegas, it's crazy, right. and it was just a few, couple weeks ago. So a year ago, I go, and was really disappointed. None of the vendors had any brochures, anything written. It's all, let me scan your badge, and I will email you this. I said, like, the sprinting is over here, it's just, and then this year, almost everybody had brochures back. And I think they, like, they realize it's just, it's something you take, you open it back, you get, Millions of emails back from nobody wants to read it right. if you give them so it's like okay There's a lot more value now. So I would say that I know retail is tough There's less retail space, but the people that have retail want to fight want to change the experience want to bring color want to bring images and that's where we as an industry can help them, right and there's I know there's customers here that do really well there well, I'm sure when you came out with Nozomi you envisioned all that corrugated being covered with advertising or something one exactly day, right? uh, Yeah, for sure I would say packaging is still, you know, we are scratching the beginning of the 0.1% of things. Right. And every day, you know, you go home, there's like more Amazon boxes and it's still very I'm ugly. I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Irene's sitting there. Can't talk about Amazon boxes Amazon, being yes, delivered. You're not, you're not, you're not <laughs> buying anything. Um, so, uh, so obviously there's gigantic opportunity. And this need to all get personalized short run. It's selling what you're putting on the box. And there's a lot of smartness of, who get what on the box, right? And it's, uh, so it's not just Amazon, it's Walmart, and it's like a lot of companies, the packaging is so important to marketplace. Uh, I would say obviously textile, okay. short run, you know, the, the, the efficiency, bringing back manufacturing into closer to the customers is true. 
outdoor, I mean, if you, you know, there's big screens, they're good in some places, they're really bad when you drive, it's distracting, they're not, you know, they, they're taking a lot of energy and all that, so the outdoors still have tremendous amount of opportunity, I would say. Uh, so there's still plenty of, you know, I was just in a trade show here, building, it's a huge show. Yeah. They like to schedule it with Connect because they know the EFI people are, I don't know, maybe that's true. And I heard people were talking to you about ceramic printing, they didn't realize who you were. <laughs> exactly, yes. I was telling him, which printer you used for that time? I said, oh, you know that? He said, yeah, you probably used Kerr printer, you were not <laughs> in the show. Uh, so there's, there's like uh, tremendous opportunities in all those areas. So, so to that point, I remember when you and I were the kids of the industry. I mean, 30 years, right? And I'm sure now the kids would like to see us both go so we can get out of their way and, and they can move up. What are the skill sets we need in this industry and how do we attract them? I would say... Um, the skill set, probably the three main one I think, one is technologist. You know, everything is done by software. Either you program or you run a software and it's like our products or somebody else's products and you want to get the maximum out of it, you want to be efficient, you want to connect your customer data, you want to give them better return on their investment with you. Uh, I think it's a skill we need more and more in the company, in, in the industry. The second thing is product management. I mean, yeah. it's, we're selling a product. And again, it's this, the market is such, you gotta be very precise, you find the value, follow the customers, figure out, you know, the, you know, the old story that customers never ask for the, the automotive, they ask for faster horses, but somebody came, you know, Henry Ford came right. with the car. It's the same thing, that's oftentimes they're not gonna ask, ask the providers for the exact product, but we know what, if we know what they're trying to do, so you gotta have great product people. I think we gotta get, and I know in the audience we have a lot of them, great salespeople. Yeah. Because how do you tell customers what capabilities and how do you tell them and get them excited about the opportunities it's bringing? Correct. Uh, Correct. Now, how do we get people to uh, come to the industry, young people? I would say, number one, people like to work on things that has mission. It's not just about career. And I think we need to emphasize this idea of making the world, uh, first of all, greener, more efficient. Right. You know, you, we print less, but we print the right things for people. Connecting images and the physical world. It's not right. just about outdoor. It's not Correct. just about things in the cloud. We live, you know, we have that, we have that, we, you know, we have those sites. So connecting that. Ability to transform uh, uh, a gigantic industries in a digital way. That I think people can dream about right. doing. Making the world better is something that the young people really want to be part of. I agree. To that point, you spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. How do you see Silicon Valley working with our industry and lifting our industry up? So, you know, so maybe I'll, I'll start with Silicon Valley and Ben Connectics. I would say it's really interesting time. It's a great time to be alive in general. If all the problems we have in the world, it's just a wonderful time to be alive. And I, I'm very excited about uh, this new decade. Uh, and I think Silicon Valley, it's like all the good things are emphasized and all the bad things that happen are emphasized. So it's like right. um, there's a lot of energy. A lot of startups, a lot of ideas, a lot of optimism uh, in, in the air. Young people trying to change the world. We're seeing a lot of uh, progress with things like artificial intelligence and big data. And, so on. and right. we're waiting for things to come. Uh, there's a, some breakthrough in certain technology. Like 5G, for example. Yeah. 5G will allow small device to connect to the internet. And at a speed of a gigabyte. And so now, obviously, you can't put in your refrigerator the artificial intelligence you want, but you can put it on the cloud. But if you don't have the speed, Correct. you know, you can't really do it. But 5G is going to open, and we have, we starting to see deployment. So there's a lot of that, so that will open IoT, open artificial intelligence, open a lot more analytics, which is great. Now, with that, obviously, you have questions on cybersecurity and privacy and regulations. Silicon Valley get a lot in the news, and oftentimes in a too negative way, and I think it's, un, it's unjustifiable in many, in many ways. You know, Facebook is a company get an attack and many times, and I think that's for, for in an unfair way, I would say, uh, just as an example, uh, because there's not really good rules on what allowed. And uh, European were ahead of us, California came with privacy rules, but it's not enough. Normally when you need to regulate industries. Politicians, governments, in our case Washington, come with some rules because they understand it. The problem with technology is we are very early on. It's complex. 
and politicians don't understand technology. Yeah. Some of you may have seen those hearings where somebody was asking, you know, the CEO of Google was asked about the Apple, Apple iPhone, why the iPhone, he says, I'm not making the iPhone. Or people say, Facebook is free, how do you make money? Well, we sell advertisement. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of rules that are unclear. And just to give a couple of examples, and it's, I'm sorry for the long answer, but maybe it's, you know, kind no, of interesting. No, it's good, it's very good. Um, just been watching that for the last day. We had a European uh, congresswoman, some member of the parliament, of the European parliament. And uh, she came, she was in Stanford talking to some high tech people, I was there. Listen, so she was very upset with Facebook because Facebook helped to disseminate this idea that vaccination against measles is a, can be bad, which is debunked, it's not true. But we have now issues of measles in the US because people believe that. Yeah. And she was expecting Facebook to say, which is a legitimate ask. But then people say, what else do you want the CEO of Facebook to screen? What if he has a very extreme opinion about, and you know, the current CEO of Facebook is a very good guy, but what if there's somebody less good that doesn't share the values? I mean, Facebook is in the news about should they filter, should they censor political ads if somebody's lying? Correct. But who's to decide who is lying? Do you want to see? I mean, so we really need regulations that come outside, and the politicians are not good enough. They're not yeah. honest enough, they're not smart enough, they're not sophisticated enough to, to do that. Um, and so this is really a tough moment for Silicon Valley. Yeah. The other thing we're seeing in Silicon Valley, and then I get to the room, is um, you know, the extreme of the, really a, the toughest problem of all, which is inequality which I think contribute to global warming and I think contribute to a lot of populism. And, you know. Because in general, things are good. So people are optimistic, they're making good money. We, yes, prices of real estate going up, but they can afford it if you're in tech and you feel good about it and you advance. And you know, you, there's a lot of demand to your skills. But if you're not in tech, you're really in a tough situation. Mm. And if you're a teacher, if you're a policeman and so on, you need to live further and further away from your work because you can't afford it right. anymore. And we all read about how many homelessness we, we have now in San Francisco. Uh, our family go and volunteer in the food bank. Uh, and we, you know, we, it's unbelievable in Silicon Valley what long line of people will stand to get a chicken, to get you know, uh, another meal because they can't afford that. Uh, so th and this is a tough question because in, in, in technology, fewer get more money. That's yeah. the way it works. Well, you can invite people to your new home, but there are mountain lions who uh, yes. scare them, exactly. <laughs> so look, you, you asked me this question three years ago, so I think turnabout's fair play. What's the one thing we don't know about you? What's the one thing we don't know, and, then I, and I wanted to share with a small formula. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, I look at the audience, I met a few people, a lot of you either travel with me, or we did dinner together, or lunch together, customers we met and had food. You, you normally, if you had more than one meal, if you know that I used to be a carnivore, like I really ate only meat. Like this, it's like it's, I didn't nothing eat. more interesting than that. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> that's not the story. And no, nothing more interesting. Than that. Uh, so when I stepped down, my, my son was after me for a while to stop eating meat, and I said I can't live the life, you know, the, the hectic life and not eating meat. But when I stepped down, he says, hey, "You're running out of excuses. A, you know, the cruelty to animals, and B, you care about." climate, you care about climate change, 25% of carbon emission is because of the meat industry. So I stopped eating meat, 14 months, and I don't miss it, so you know, I don't know, maybe that. How about that? You should have told me that when we had dinner last night, because I had a steak and you had lobster, so right, I exactly. wish I would have known, I felt badly. <laughs> so how about a few speed dating questions? Okay. Vacation, what's your favorite place? I was very fortunate to, to go a lot of places in the world and, and, and go with my family. We love, US has amazing places. We love going to Asia and Latin America. Uh, some places of civilization not developed enough. People are relatively poor, but they're happy and they advance and technology is helping them. And you're excited, we were in a village in China and they were using solar energy. First time they had electricity there. So uh, but I would say if I have to pick one that I recommend and people can do it is, is Antarctica. Really? It's just, it's incredible. You have to take a boat from uh, Argentina. It's a couple of days. Uh, and, but it's, first of all, the rules there is that you cannot have more than 100 people on the show at one time in one location. So when you go down, and when you only can go during the summer, it's 24 hours a day, uh, daytime. So you can hike at like 1 a.m. Well, look, we're looking for a Nozomi salesperson here if you're interested. In Antarctica. <laughs> uh, the demand is huge. <laughs> Favorite book? Um, so I, you know, I was lucky to, uh, to read a few books in the, in the year that, so I, w I would, uh, 
I, I knew you were going to ask me that. So, because it's, it's a favorite, and I'm, I'm, I'm dreading the next favorite, so I'll try to dwell on the favorite book for now. Uh, so, one great book is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. A guy named is, is, is an Israeli guy, don't hold him against him, no, just kidding. <laughs> Yuval Hari, he wrote the book uh, Sapiens, which is an amazing book about Homo sapiens and the involvement, and so how we came about, which is an amazing story. But he wrote this book 21, just about a year ago, a year and a half ago. He's talking about how artificial intelligence is going to change our life, how technology, and it is super logical. It takes you step by step by step by step. And, you know, in a way, it's scary. In a way, it's exciting. But it's really giving you good preparation for the world. The second book that I read that I really like uh, is, uh, I mean, but that's, you know, maybe me is, <laughs> it's a tough book to read. The book called Rise and Kill First. Mm -hmm. And it's the history of targeted killing by Israel which at some point had to fight terrorists and decided we're going to, and you know, when you go after Osama bin Laden and you go, I don't want to talk about what happened last few weeks, you go after somebody, everybody agree, great to kill this guy. But then the question, the moral question is, is it good to do it in a more extensive way? Who decides? Right. I'll give you just one question. Stopping Iran from having a nuclear bomb meant the top 15 scientists, nuclear science in Iran, had to die. Is this moral? Can Israel mm. do that? Huge amount of argument, and I, I, honestly, I don't know the answer. On one end, you have to stop them, so it's it's. But it's you're French, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to trust you're not going to answer this like Benny Landa. Favorite movie? <laughs> I need to go. The last memorable. I dread this answer. I actually don't have a favorite movie. Uh, I you know every movie I like and don't like. I have this bug in my mind when I look at a movie. I remember those guys read the script. And I remember there's a camera, and if they don't do well, they can do it over and over. So I kind of they're actors. Yeah, uh, they're actors. Exactly. All right, so, so speaking of that, do you have a favorite actor or actress? So I don't really, that's kind of, that's, you know, I, I knew you were going to ask that too. So um, <laughs> I don't know a lot of celebrities. I often think like if I fly and I happen to be on a business class or first class because I fly a lot. You don't need to know them personally. It's just you watch them. No, I'm just saying <laughs> it's very possible there's a celebrity next, sitting next to me, and I'm the only person on the airplane that doesn't know uh, but I would say the few actors and actresses I like are people that I saw uh, essentially doing multiple roles, very different roles, and can be very convincing. So I would say on the actress side, Meryl Streep. Mine too. Definitely not overrated. I agree. That. She's amazing. Uh, on the actor side, maybe Tom Hanks. I saw him in, on Broadway on stage. I saw him. So they, those guys can adapt to anyone. I agree. I agree. So if you didn't join EFI and you didn't become the CEO of EFI, what, what would you have done, do you think? Where do you think your career would have taken you? French uh, painter. <laughs> but by the way, note to myself, when you leave a job, make sure you delete all the embarrassing photos on your hard disk, because who knows what it is. Um, the, uh, I love, love, love software engineering. When I was software engineer, I just love it. It's a combination of art and science. And uh, actually, when I joined EFI, I was director of engineering, supposed to manage people. I thought I can actually develop software. And that lasted about a couple of weeks, and then I gave up, and it was a sad day for me. So probably I would just say career of software. Good. Do a lot of coding in your spare time? Do a lot of coding time? in my yeah. spare time. Good, good, good. That's where you are in your basement. <laughs> Who's the most influential person in your business life? I was so lucky. Oh, wait a second, I need to say Jeff Jacobson. <laughs> um, I was so lucky to meet so many great people. I was in, see, in Silicon Valley, we had a group of over 20 CEOs. I met a full day every quarter. And I learned from all of them. And I just like, if, I, I feel bad because I think, I don't think I bought as much value as they bought to the, but uh, so I learned a lot. But I, you know, uh, I often think that maybe the person very early in my career that influenced, I was a bridge player in Israel. I was in the junior team and then the open team. My bridge coach was a harsh guy, but he taught me a lot of good life lessons for business. For example, the art of the comeback. He often told me, he says, doesn't matter how behind you are in a game, stay calm, look for the opportunity to come back. And if you watch any sport, it happened, right? I remember a game in Italy. Italy was one of the two best teams in Europe. They were leading, they were favorite. We were behind, we, they made a mistake. Oops. But I have a very loud voice. <laughs> we were behind, made a mistake. Should we start from all the questions in the beginning? Yes, we'll go to the beginning. Okay. 
and an big, I remember this. Big welcome for Guy Gack. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Very good. It's good to be back. Let me set the expectations <laughs> low. Okay. Um, so, it's like to come day. back, the second advice he gave me was, um, I used to, after the game, we would lose the game, and he'd say, guy, you made a mistake, this was the game, it was different. I said, no, let me explain to you why, how I play made a lot of sense. At some point, he told me, look, do you want to win the game, or you want to have this perfect explanation and be right? And it's always stuck to me that, like, in life, you get into the situation, and you can say something that later you can say, oh, I, I just did the right thing. Right. You know, I made the obvious move and so on. But you want to make sure that you're doing things that, you, you know, in your gut, you know, will be successful right. in business. And then the third thing he said, you know, don't get intimidated by whatever. You play against a much stronger players. They are actually more stressed than you are because they, you can be. And I think in life, you, I got to meet, like, you know, big CEOs like Jeff Jacobson and, and other people. And, and, you know, we were a small company, but I never felt intimidated. I said, look, it's, I'm going to come. I'm going to tell my story. What I, how can we work together? And, and, and so be it. So I think, you know. You, you were always, and I think, you know, if we go back 20 years with this, it was always about partnership. It was right. always about finding a win-win. We would agree we, where we would compete. We would agree where we would partner, and it was transparent, and that's right. what made the business yeah. relationships like very easy. I felt like if people can trust you, um, exactly. They, you know, and I learned it, by the way, that if we're talking about lessons, and hey, I have a minute, uh, and I, I don't want to answer That's the all right. Question. The drinks are out there waiting for them. They're okay. Yeah, everybody would <laughs> like to wait for the drinks, I'm sure. Um, so I learned a lot from officer class in, in Israel. And actually, they teach you what caused somebody to follow you in the most extreme situation, uh, a battlefield, when people shoot at you, when life is at stake, and get a bullet, you can be, you know, can be injured for the rest of your life and be... So it's going to be pretty devastating. And they need to follow you as a commander. And they said it's not because of your rank. It's not because they're afraid of you. The main reason why they follow you is because they're trusting what you do. And, exactly. and you care about them. And I think I learned that. And people follow you because they're trusting what you do. I agree. So, Guy, you've been up here 18 years. You've been associated with this company for 25 years. Everybody here loves you. Last word is yours. Thank you very much. So, first of all, it was great to come back. It's like... It gave a new meaning of being, feel like at home. I see people that I didn't see and people come to me and it's like, um, yesterday at, after dinner, we ran into some customers and one of the guys says, those are customers of Radius. And the first thing I said, so how do we do for you guys? It's like, it's not we anymore, but I still think sure. I see myself related. Definitely, I'm, I, I'm very excited to see you at the role. Uh, I would say for the audience, you know, there's gonna be some tough times, there's gonna be some tough uh, pressure on the industry, but there's gonna be some opportunities. Stay optimist, focus on the positive. This industry is tremendous. We have a lot of family-owned businesses. It's, a, it's the most creative industry by a long shot. Mm -hmm. Stay good to the core, both EFI and the customers. A lot of good things, a lot of good deals ahead of us. And you know, I'll be a fan. I'll yeah. uh, show up and, uh, and we'll love to see you guys success and, and enjoy the ride ahead. Excellent, big hand for Guy Gack. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.